This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Thursday, November 5th, 2020. I'm Caleb Brown. One big loser this election cycle, drug prohibition, as states and one district spanning the political spectrum moved to either decriminalize or legalize not just cannabis, but other drugs as well. Cato's Walter Olson discusses the range of initiatives presented to voters this year and how they turned out. The big story, at least from the ballot initiatives, was the wide variety of places and specific technical details of reducing, once again, prohibition on drugs. That was, in fact, one of the big trends. Uh, It was amazing how successful those propositions and initiatives were to back off of the drug war. They were successful in liberal states and conservative states. They were successful on uh, recreational marijuana and mushrooms and related substances and on, in Oregon, more broadly for drugs. Uh, So we have a lot of movement. And I'm not aware of a single one that went down to defeat of the many that were uh, high profile ballot measures around the country. Uh, yeah, in Oregon specifically, it seems like this was these were pretty well thought out when they moved to legalize so-called magic mushrooms. They have given the Oregon Health Authority a couple of years to write uh, licensing and regulation rules for what they call psilocybin, psilocybin surface centers for people 21 years old and over. And of course, they've decriminalized broadly uh, the consumption of fairly small amounts of all illegal drugs. And that last one is politically really pretty amazing. I mean, those of us on the libertarian side have gone through uh, pretty much our whole lives uh, until recently uh, being told uh, it's politically impractical. You know, don't even bother arguing the practicalities as in Portugal uh, of, of doing it. The public will never accept it. It will never be a majority issue and the politicians know that. Uh, and that has changed very rapidly. Uh, on mushrooms, D.C. is doing it its own way. Washington, D.C., which probably needs magic mushrooms more than any other community in the country, um, the uh, the approach there is to uh, knock it down to the lowest possible level of criminal enforcement priority. And obviously that's different from uh, the idea of, of planned out regulation and supply, but it's an important gesture just the same. And it seems a uh, very, at least substantively similar to the cannabis legalization that uh, DC undertook recently in that it's legal to possess, grow, give away, but there is no set of rules governing how it could be bought or sold legally. And of course, there is a longstanding ongoing debate uh, among those who would like freer access and, and less criminal penalties in these areas. Uh, is it better to go the decriminalization route and just try to keep the government out of it that way? Or is it better to go the legalization route, which often comes with taxation, regulation, sometimes with uh, monopolies or limited government uh, service grants of various sorts? Uh, We're not going to resolve that because there are good libertarians on both sides. But it is interesting that uh, both approaches uh, gained ground on Tuesday. There were, uh, and there were some states that uh, that legalized uh, cannabis for some purposes. Uh, most notably, Mississippi uh, passed a uh, a medical marijuana bill or mar- medical marijuana initiative. Well, if you look at some of the states that moved this year, uh, Mississippi, South Dakota, with recreational marijuana, uh, Montana, uh, as well as Arizona, New Jersey. These are not your experimental try anything once, but, uh, you know, Pacific Coast type states. These are politically some of the more conservative states in, in several instances. They are, uh, not states where there's been any problem in getting people to use marijuana. Of course, people have been using it there all along, but where the political climate would have seemed until recently almost unthinkable uh, to get legalization. So in California, there was a a law on the books, AB5, that made it difficult for uh, so-called 1099 employees or freelancers to get a lot of work. And during the pandemic, that that cost a lot of people uh, pretty dearly. Uh, Proposition 22 got rid of it. 
by a wide margin. And to me, this was one of the most heartening results because the attempt to strangle the gig economy and that is not too strong a way to describe what AB5 did, drafted by labor unions, um, uh, ruinous to uh, the business models, not only of delivery and uh, ride sharing uh, apps, but uh, extending to countless other types of freelancers, uh, writers, musicians, designers, all sorts. Now, uh, that law provoked an enormous outcry and it was very difficult to get them to listen they uh, have played around at the edges with some of the most sympathetic groups, um, uh, fr freelance editors and, and so forth. Uh, uh, but they were not intending at all to back off of the central attempt to rope everyone into employment relationships, whether or not they fit freelance arrangements. And in particular, they were after the Ubers and the Lyfts of the world. Now, People have mixed feelings about exactly how this was uh, partially remedied through initiative. Uh, the uh, What happened was that the ride-sharing people got together, and of course they've got many, many drivers, many of whom uh, wanted to get rid of this uh, new constraint because they realized they wouldn't do as well. And they did an initiative that just carved out that sub-industry, if you want to call it that. And uh, so... You have critics saying, well, you know, are we going to be left as less politically organized uh, lines of work to still have to face the awful, awful results of AB5? And that's a real argument that, you know, you, you have to sympathize with. On the other hand, I think uh, that the... Um, First, this is a tremendous rebuke to the California legislature, and it hits them right in the center of what they were trying to go after. Uh, it also takes away some of the supporters, as well as some of the critics from the political equation, because now the groups that were in it because they wanted to unionize Uber and Lyft and so forth don't have as much reason to lobby in Sacramento. So to me, this is taking back one big chunk of liberty uh, with very much the agenda of going and getting more of it uh, by whatever means, whether it be more uh, ballot measures or simply talking sense into that California legislature, if that's not a contradiction in terms. So, I mean, these things that were done via ballot initiative seem like the kinds of things that, in a sense, had to be done via ballot initiative. I know Paul Jacob and others, people who are big fans of the of the ballot initiative in general, view it as something like a pressure valve that is uh, for, for legislatures, that is legislative overreach or uh, legislatures that may or may not be bought off by some uh, special interest that ballot initiatives can provide uh, that sort of uh, pressure valve. Um, for a lot of the measures that were on the ballot here, it seems like people were expressing themselves in a broadly liberty-friendly way. They were this year in most cases. And I would step back and caution a little about the initiative process because obviously it can be used for anti-libertarian means. We haven't talked about the Florida ballot measure to impose a $15 an hour minimum wage, which was popular and appears to have passed. Uh, libertarians don't like that. And there's another thing, even when you can argue uh, in favor of the content of uh, an initiative, uh, there's something very inflexible because if you didn't get the details right, it can be very hard to change it. Often the, it, the legislature is prevented from going in and tinkering depending on what state you're in. So it's often not a first best solution as the economists would call it, uh, but it gets the attention of the legislature and often it is enough to get them to preemptively make the law more liberty friendly for fear that an initiative uh, will take the whole issue out of their hands. So um, a lot of good can be done with it. You just have to watch out. Uh, the, the In California, there have been a number of uh, bad initiatives that have stayed with us and continue to make California uh, a, a more highly regulated place in the case of the, you know, the ubiquitous Proposition 13 warning levels or the regulation of the insurance industry that was brought in during one of the fights they had with trial lawyers. These are bad laws and very hard to get rid of if they are coming from the anti-liberty side. Illinois, as uh, anyone who follows the events in that state knows, is in a dire financial circumstances, uh, and yet voters in Illinois chose not to raise 
taxes there on on higher earners? There was a progressive income tax proposal that uh, Governor Pritzker of Illinois had pushed very hard. It's somewhat ironic that he is uh, just about as rich as someone can be, uh, but saw that as the way of solving Illinois' problems. But the voters did not see it that way. And uh, they sent him back uh, without his new high progressive income tax rates. In California, where Proposition 13, of course, originated the tax revolt and uh, got a lot of people interested in what could be done with the initiative process. Uh, there was an attempt to kind of divide and conquer by peeling off the commercial and business uh, property tax and saying that uh, you could remove some of the Proposition 13 protections from that. And voters were closely split, but last I saw, uh, that was not passing either. So uh, with tax issues, you do start out on the right foot in that the public is pretty skeptical of anything that's going to raise taxes. And finally, uh, states, including Virginia, my most recent former Commonwealth, had issues related to election procedures, that is uh, fighting gerrymandering, uh, as did Alaska and Massachusetts, though their their measures were about so-called ranked choice voting. Yes, in Virginia and Missouri, there were uh, citizen redistricting commission ideas on the ballot. With Virginia, although I haven't looked at all the details and the, sometimes the details are not perfectly drafted, I, politically, it was kind of inspiring to see that uh, there was a real effort in the legislature to back off of the gerrymandering that has characterized Virginia in recent years and do something better. Uh, and actually a bipartisan effort, when the Virginia legislature changed partisan hands, some uh, Democrats in the Washington, D.C. suburbs uh, hoped to kind of you know, break the deal and kill the initiative so that the Democrats could have complete control and do what they wanted. And voters said no. And uh, frankly, a lot of Democrats said no. <laughs> they would rather go forward with something that seemed fair to everyone than pursue narrow partisan interest. Uh, Missouri, uh, it's a closer outcome. Uh, I think that the reformists may have uh, won a small victory, but uh, haven't gone back to make sure. Ranked choice voting is an interesting innovation pursued in other countries and under various formats and now familiar not only in a bunch of American cities, but also in the state of Maine, which ran its Senate election under ranked choice voting. And uh, under ranked choice voting, instead of simply voting for one candidate, you get to vote favorite second favorite, third favorite, and then as minor candidates are eliminated, their votes are reallocated, ones who are still in the race. Now, um, this is obviously attractive if you are uh, someone who enjoys voting for the Libertarian Party candidate in order to show what your real beliefs are, but worries about taking votes away from what might be an important choice between the, the major party candidates. Ranked choice voting allows you to vote your conscience and then make a second choice of, of the whichever major party candidate you think would do a better job. Uh, and there are a bunch of other reasons why libertarians uh, often are interested in it. Unfortunately, uh, from the advocate standpoint, the voters of Massachusetts were not quite interested enough, and it seems to have narrowly failed there. We will be hearing more about it, though, in the future as people get more used to the idea. Walter Olson is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Subscribe to the Cato Daily Podcast anywhere you please and follow us on Twitter at Cato Podcast.